it's me, Jay, your DM. I use he, him. I'm Jerika. I use she, her. I'm Shiny Batgirl, and I guess I'm going next. I also use she, her. And I'm Air. I use he, him. And this is Insight Check, where we delve into the dungeon of your bad decisions and retrieve the treasure of wisdom. And that's how a professional does it. <laughs> yeah, that was sexy. That's why they call me old One Take J. <laughs> now, Doctor in chat okay. says, actually, Jay, Jerika is my DM. Well, Whoa. that's blasphemy. I'm everybody's I mean, true. DM. Hashtag right? not my DM. <laughs> I'm everybody's DM for this night, one night it's only. True. You're like grand DM. Yeah, grand actually, Jerika has been my mm-hmm. DM too, so. Yeah. I, but I'm Jerika's DM, and therefore, derivatively, I'm your DM. So <laughs> through the property of DM transubstantiation, exactly. yeah, six exactly. degrees of DM, DM um, transference or something. Yeah. For Kevin Bacon was the first DM. Yeah. Uh, the DM of my DMs. DM is also my DM. Carpe DM. All right. <laughs> Are you seizing you. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, uh, hello and welcome to Insight Check, another beautiful week of this wonderful show. We are recording live in front of a studio audience. Not exactly. The studio is kind of very large and it is called The Entire World. Uh, We are streaming this episode and people are watching it live. If you were not there for that, there are YouTube VODs, there are Twitch VODs, there is a podcast that you're listening to now, and we will of course be linking anything that we mention or talk about during the course of the show or demonstrate to our audience during the course of the show. Uh, we will be linking everything in the Twitter. You can always follow us at Insight Check Pod to make sure that you catch up on everything that we are linking or talking about. So we are gathered here today to talk about one of the greatest challenges during Dungeons & Dragons, and that is coming up with NPCs on the fly. It can be really hard. Uh, But we have ways of making it easier and words of encouragement for those of you seeking to improve this skill. And it is a skill. It is something you learn and grow with. Uh, And in order to best tackle this topic, we are first going to go on a dungeon crawl. Uh, Dungeon crawl is where we look at what is new and exciting and cool or useful in Dungeons and Dragons over the last week. Tools we found or things we love that are tangentially related to our topic of role-playing advice. Uh, I would very much like to point people in the direction of a wonderful tool that is called This Is Your Life in Xanathar's Guide to Monsters. I've already talked about this in the past. Uh, We've mentioned this. There is a very handy website that has condensed this all down into a single click. So you just click roll again and it will give you the whole character's life. What? And it get, it is one page. It gives you a class, a family, an upbringing, life events, a trinket, overview, their background, and their ideals, their bonds, and their flaws. It is a wonderful, wonderful program. You can also specify certain backgrounds, certain races, certain classes, if you would like to hone in a little bit, if you know some things about this NPC beforehand. And I'm showing everybody this right now on the stream. So, you can click uh, Aarakocra. You can click barbarian you want an aarakocra barbarian but you don't know anything else about him and then you click that and then you roll again you are a 20 year old true neutral aarakocra sage adventuring as a barbarian you became a sage because you were naturally curious so you packed up and went to a university to learn about the world you became a barbarian because your anger needed to be channeled into battle or you risked becoming an indiscriminate killer so now you have a basic outline for an npc that you can always pull up so dexter yeah, there yeah, you go. This one, exactly. <laughs> uh, it is the Aarakocra oh. version of Dexter. Uh, it is a one-click tool that will roll you a very basic character. Now, this is in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which we gave away earlier in the stream, so you're welcome. Uh, but this is a website version of that, which makes it a little uh, simpler and easier to condense into one page. Um, and the best thing about this is, while it's intended for rolling up interesting characters... For NPCs, there's just nothing better than one click getting a whole backstory right up here. So if you need an NPC who's going to be sticking around for a while, try out This Is Your Life from Xanathar's Guide to Everything or this website, which I'm linking, and that will assist you, hopefully. All right, that is my dungeon crawl. I sometimes get NPC ideas from media that I watch. 
and I have started watching the very awesome The Dragon Prince. Oh, hang on, is... Jerica, hang on. I got, mm, oh, oh man, I'm, I'm just savoring the flavor of that delicious segue. That was so good. I mm-hmm. mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> you are segue J, but but you are also senpai. So there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, Dragon so, Prince is really good. I, I was loving so watching good. it. Savory, and I, I am very impressed by their choices, and I love all of the characters, and they are great fodder for your own D and Ds. So I highly recommend it. Um, it is by the, I believe, the director of Avatar: The Last Airbender, um, and it is on Netflix right now. Don't don't stop listening to us and go watch it. Yeah, you stay Listen here. Listen to us and then go watch it. <laughs> Should I put Netflix on the stream? Is that like legal? <laughs> no, just Nerdflurks. Just just go Nerd to Nerdflurks. It's fine. yeah. Go to Nerdflurks. If you don't know what that is, watch our previous episodes. It's an in joke. We're very funny. <laughs> very, very funny. <laughs> Aye, aye, aye. Absolutely. <laughs> this is like us trying to tell a joke and we just look at someone and go, humor. 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 <laughs> this is the funny part, guys. You should laugh now. Everybody knows that in order to be truly funny, you must call attention to every joke you make. Clearly, and explain it thoroughly afterwards. Mm-hmm. That's important. Uh, so for me, I build a lot of NPCs. I'm super obsessed with building characters. Um, I love playing guest characters and building characters for my world. But mostly, I was just going to say the DMs Guild is a great place for people who have already built super thorough NPCs. If you want to grab something real quick, you can donate to some of our really brilliant minds out there donating things or contributing things to the DMsGuild.com. But that is also a really good resource. Can you tell us a little bit about one NPC that you have discovered in that trove of knowledge? Oh, geez. So there's a whole NPCs and towns thing. I'll have to find the link for it um, shortly. But uh, there's an NPCs module and a towns module. And I've actually used one of their towns, Sunma, which one of my players might find uh, familiar. And it's a super thorough town. It's got NPCs already complete with hooks. I will look at the uh, module and um, later we can give credit to the actual creator of it. But, uh, you know, I donated a couple bucks on DMs Guild and I got this thoroughly made town. So as, as much as I love to build my own PC, my own NPCs and my own towns, when I am uh, short for time, the DMs Guild has got so much information already of people who've already put all that thought in and, you know, really developed a very thorough NPC and it's just sitting there ready ready for you guys to use that is a really great suggestion thank you my r's might sound more like w's because god there's been a lot of bananas today let's talk about npcs npcs are obviously characters that you come up with uh that are meant to fill out a world to help it feel more fleshed out generally they serve some sort of function in so much as you have to talk to them to get something that you want uh, something that you need uh, out of a, another character. So if your characters are starting a quest, they may need to go talk to an NPC to get relevant information. It may be even that part of the quest is finding the NPC they need to talk to, and that's part of the fun. Um, and so making NPCs is very common. Typically, as a DM, you like to have these things prepared ahead of time because you're you want to be as prepared as possible so you know who they're going to run into, what's going to happen. But the reality of D&D is that your players are going to screw up your plans. <laughs> For reals. Uh, so you have to be ready to react on the fly. And that is where the ability to generate PCs quickly on the fly is extremely important. Can I tell an illustrative story? I would love that. And I know I have some players in chat, uh, and they probably won't be surprised at all. But (laughs) so I had my team of crack adventurers go into a theater that was being renovated in Waterdeep. And the theater had been taken over by basically a mob group. And I thought it would make sense when they got to the theater that there might be a guard there that I had not planned for. So I made... A good, good half-orc boy, uh, and uh, I made him pretty quickly. Uh, (laughs) And the next day, 
they came back to the theater and I made his brother. Well, there you go. Yes. And I love them. Mm-hmm. And that's how it often happens with these NPCs you make up on the fly. You give them a weird voice or a weird name and the players gravitate towards that. Like, uh, for example, Draika, when you had that uh, guy who pulled your rickshaw and you just sort of gravitated towards this fellow. <laughs> like, he was just a rickshaw driver that came out of nowhere because you wanted somebody to pull your rickshaw. And then later... I you bonded just... with him. We bonded. Yeah. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're bros now. I ended up having to give him a name and, he like, make a... a grave for me. It was great. Yeah. It's always the NPCs you least expect that they end up attaching themselves to. I know Jerry has said about Trevor, our fa- favorite werewolf NPC, that he was just made up on the fly. He barely knew anything about Trevor except for what his motivations might be and made our favorite little southern werewolf. So I, I love that idea that, you know, that sometimes NPCs that you randomly run into are the ones that are the most interesting. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so NPCs are, are a critical part of your game, but the, the problem with an NPC is that if you're not prepared for that NPC, it can be really tricky. You can get very tripped up. If somebody says something like, oh, what's this person's name? That can be a real hassle, because now you've, if you don't have that name already, you've got to come up with that name. And not only that, but later if they ask that name again, if they forget, you've got to remember what that name was. I wrote Uh, it down. It started with a B. Exactly. And then his brother's name also started with a B. So this website we're on right now is a classic of Insight Check. It is Fantasy Name Generator. I love it. Uh, It is a Insight Check classic. We've already talked about it at length, so I won't go into too much detail. But effectively, it is just a bunch of names of different places, different kinds. So you can go to like fantasy names. You can go down to Amazon names. It'll give you names of Amazons. So (laughs) Salippi, Rail, Gryophail, Iom, Bleodlin. Just weird names that you don't hear much uh, and that are not going to be, you know, you'll have to go through a couple lists before you find the one you like a lot. Like here's Ukisi. I like Ukisi. That's kind of fun. Yeah, and names are strangely important. They really make your players feel like the world is new. And I know this has been brought up in other pods before, but, you know, if you just, like, say, oh, I don't know, it's Bill, the guy's name is Bill, then your players already feel like you didn't know who that person was, and that's a big deal to them. Yeah, and uh, so here's my other tip. Uh, If you don't play online, you may think that Roll20 is not necessary for your game. I disagree. I think even if you're playing in person, having Roll20 open and using it for its tools that it has is very useful. Um, But if you are playing online, then doubly so. Roll20 can be very helpful. You can just create new NPC and then type that name in as soon as you say it. Like, just as soon as you introduce this NPC, type the name down. Or if you have a little notebook, scrawl it in your notebook. Whatever you gotta do, just make sure that you're writing these things down as you go. You will not remember after the session. I can almost guarantee. And then they're gonna come back next week and be like, Hey! That's not the name that character was. <laughs> yeah, I do that for my my in-person games, too. I have a little um, chest of note cards that every time I have an NPC, like especially in my main town, if they interact with one of my players or they establish an opinion of one of my players, I jot it down on the note cards because I don't have a big enough brain to remember all that stuff. I'm not as awesome as our DMJ here. And always write down NPC names with four lines below them. Because as you accumulate experiences with this NPC, you're also going to need space to go back and add details as you as you put things in stone. Oh, I thought you meant underlining them four times so that <laughs> you don't miss them in your notes. Don't no, forget like this it, guy. Just leave Bill. a little room Bill. so you can go back and uh, type in just like, uh, oh, this person said this, or this person does this, or this person believes this thing. Yeah, I'm a physical things nerd. I love to have... Um, pieces of paper to go over my characters. I I had an online game that I ran in Roll20 and it is super, the compendium they have and the resources they give you are super helpful. The next thing that you'll need to know about an NPC is your players will pick fights that you didn't expect. With NPCs, you didn't want them fighting. Uh, And so uh, you will oftentimes need the NPC stat block compendium. This is something I'm going to link as well. Uh, This is a PDF chock full of every class in the game in a stat block form. So Arcana Priest, Death Priest, Forge Priest, Grave Priest, all these different classes have a different version. 
it, some of them are already in the books. So you'll see in this list, it'll tell you what to look up in the books to that if the books have something that'll work. But everyone that doesn't have something in the books is in this uh, this document here. I'm raising my hand. I, I, a point of clarification. Yes. Forge priest. Are they a priest that uses forges? Are they a priest <laughs> for forges? <laughs> they are a priest that uses forges. They worship <laughs> forges as a... Um, they they worship the act of creation, uh, which I think is a more... <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Like fabrication. I got you. Uh, anyway. You have to exercise Boo. the demons from your forges, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes they get demons. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, usually in the form of methods. You know? yep. Just you an just infestation. Throw a priest right into the flames. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Purify your forges. <laughs> but yes, this document is just chock full. One person who is credited in the document uh, went through and made an NPC stat block for every class that didn't currently have an NPC stat block. And it is glorious for picking up a... Because it has a nice little chart on the first... Or on one of the early pages that tells you the CR of the NPC. And so you can just go, I need a CR5 NPC. This is a pretty tough guy. Uh, so I just look through here what's the closest... Uh, oh, Enchanter. Uh, and then I just scroll down to the CR5 section and I get that Enchanter and I use them and it's good to go. Fantastic resource for coming up with stat blocks on the fly. Uh, absolutely worthwhile to use or to have in your favorites bar. Uh, and of course, if you're a physical player, you can always print these things off in your, your fancy little printer and use them at your table. Uh, and very much so, I would like to thank the person who made this. Give me just a second as I go to the credits page because it is uh, only right. It was made by GQ69. Uh, Gay nice. <laughs> Lord Queen sixty nine sex number the sexy sex times. number yeah it's super uh, important so credit to Gay Lord Queen uh, and of course with help by all of these wonderful people listed below this is an absolutely incredible document I do recommend it highly and it will help you with your NPCs on the fly yeah that's one of the really cool things about D and D is that we are such a community based game that it's you know when people create resources like this for us it's super important to give them credit for all of the hard work they mm -hmm. did because you know we're a family and D and D is super important to all of us um, now let's get into some Q's and A's about these NPCs we have a we list of Q's that we've been collecting yes. yeah so it is, you know, it is about that time. That really leads me into our first question here, which is about becoming better at portraying different PCs. So on the RPG section, uh, role-playing games of Stack Exchange, we have a question uh, that has been kicking around on here for almost eight years, and it's a long, lengthy thread that's been viewed thousands of times, and it asks... One of the biggest problems I have as a game master going on 30 plus years is in portraying NPC and monsters in any RPG. Is there a good resource for becoming a better, air quotes, actor? Instead of just saying the monster or NPC acts like or says blah, 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 I prefer to act out the part whenever I can. This adds a bit more flavor and brings some fun to the table, but I f sometimes feel my NPCs and monsters are a bit similar and frankly boring and this comes to us from chuck so what are our tips for being able to portray a wider swath of different npcs so matthew mercer gave this tip which is that not all npcs come from voices if you're playing in person you can actually change up your body language to convey a different npc yes. so if you're not good at voices and you play in person changing up your body language might help you uh, one thing that I found helps establish an NPC's identity really well is to go into Roll20 and uh, make a character sheet for them where I just put their name and an image. So it goes into the player's logs so they can easily pull up that character to remember what they're about. Uh, I make it editable by the players, so if they ever have anything they want to add in, they can go back and add in. Um, but they, they can just at least have the name and the image of that character and it establishes a general impression on them right away. Uh, so that's one thing that you can do online and then another thing you can do in person to kind of help differentiate your NPCs. But I'd like to hear from everybody else. I tend to get a lot of, um, inspiration from different, the different quote unquote races. 
So um, I recently made an NPC who is a tabaxi, and he's very, he, he's a little bit underhanded. He likes to find things that people have lost in the outdoor market and resell it to them for a finder's fee. Um, but that kind of came from like cats being interested in tabaxi or cat people. And um, this sort of idea for this NPC came from the idea that cats like, you know, to play with things and they're a little bit sneaky and things like that. So I got a lot of good um, meat from kind of like the, the race, if you will. My uh, general tip for the last game I ran, uh, we were running a Dungeon World uh, game to try out the system. And I think one of the core conceits of that game is um, rely on your players to bring the flavor. Um, players tend to create elaborate and lovely bl uh, backstories. So when I needed NPCs, I needed villains, I needed characters for inter for them to interact with, I needed the entire crux of the narrative. That all came from the backstories they gave me. Uh, for example, there was in uh, Jerika's backstory, she was playing an amnesiac druid, and she happened to get her backstory to me first, so it's the one I had the most time with. So I was like, okay, I'm going to base the the big baddie of this arc of this game we're going to play on her backstory and then that starts getting the wheels turning around who is this person how did they you know cause the calamity that uh caused her to have amnesia and have her you know place of of home be destroyed and whatnot and all of that fed into creating that character the same thing with cupcake had a a little lizard person named Simber who was uh, came upon their magical fire powers by means of uh, a life or death situation with a hunter. So I had to create that hunter because uh, they were going to have an encounter with them still looking for them after being horribly burned. Uh, so and in that instance, the first thing I wanted was a really cool voice. So I started getting uh inspiration from I don't know why, but I went to Gambit. I, I pictured someone in a long trench coat. So Gambit from the X-Men. And then I wanted to make sure that I could do some sort of shitty interpretation of a uh, <laughs> of a Zadiko, you know, uh, Creole sort of accent. So he came out sort of like this. Um, I apologize to anyone who is listening to this that might be from any part of New Orleans. <laughs> any um, part of the world. Any really. part of the world, really. Yeah, um, if you're from any anywhere on Earth, then we just, we're sorry. We're like this, and we can't help it. Also, I did take a huge swig of Hennessy, so I am they made increasingly us. drunk. They keep <laughs> bananasing us, which is rude, because it was supposed to be a safe word, and safe words are supposed to be safe. <laughs> First this word. This word is very unsafe. I it is now. I feel fire through my entire body you yeah I, jay I, I do want to check in with you shiny does seem to be holding her liquor well how are you feeling jay i'm doing great i've honestly never felt stronger i saw in <laughs> chat you were using words like burning and fire that's how it feels I've, when you're awesome i've never felt more powerful than I do. or <laughs> invincible like i could kill a man with my bare hands oh, no. <laughs> no. It's never felt like such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call me Air Enabler. The in person, the NPCs. I don't uh, do voices really in person. I DM physically with people right in front of me, and I'm not a voice doer. So I do a lot of, um, like you said, physical mannerisms and even just um, inflection and how quickly or slowly an NPC talks. Something that I saw one of Matt Mercer's early like be a better DM videos was just about, you know, making quick notes about your NPCs. I, I am a super spreadsheet documentation nerd, so I write down everything. But if you're in a hurry, if you just really quickly write down like how kind of how old your NPC was and if they had any specific accent, if you're an accent doer, you know, then that can give you a really quick um, reference back to that person again. And if you have a handful of voices that you do, then that's really cool. Because I know after playing with Air and playing with Jay and Jerika here, I, I, being someone who doesn't do, do voices, it makes me want to learn how. Because it's so much fun to hear them bring in this NPC with some ridiculous voice and some ridiculous monologue just makes my fucking day. So if, if you have that ability, <laughs> I so recommend it. It's super so satisfying. Here's, so here's the thing about voices. The thing about voices is you just have to go for it. 
you can't you can't sit here and think about it too much. And once you've gone for it, you do have to just commit to it. No matter how dumb it sounds, if you commit, they will buy into the bit. Um, it's like with the uh, world famous voice actor Matthew Mercer and his uh, international superstar Matthew yes. Cat Super. Killer Mercer, is- <laughs> Matthew Cat Stomper Mercer. <laughs> oh no! Um, so Matthew Cat Stomper Mercer does do a voice in his first campaign where he plays a kind of hillbilly explosion loving gunsling uh, gunsmith, and it's like a very weird voice. And his players just kept going back to that guy for that weird. voice voice uh and that's fine like you know that's how you make npcs memorable uh first of all by uh, you know being matthew cat stomper mercer but second of all by really committing to the bit so when i go into a voice like this my first reaction might be this was a bad idea but i've already committed to it and god Damn it, you're going to hear for the rest of the night. I'm so happy. Can you give us some Clarence, please? Oh, boy, everybody. I, <laughs> I don't I don't mean to cause any trouble, but I just think that we should get out of here. And and just to really reiterate the range of our DMJ, <laughs> can you give us a little uh, Thordak, the ancient red dragon? Oh, no. Soon. You will all know fear. I hate it. Ah! <laughs> the, my favorite J voice has been the swan um, deity lady from the Fey Wild when I was with the F team. That swan goddess lady was crazy. That voice was so good. It made me want to learn how to do voices. <laughs> Wasn't she just like super mellow? She was super that, like, slow her and super mellow. Yeah. It was a voice I might actually be able to do. I think it's why I found it inspiring. But yeah, it, I think it really motivates your players. Changing your speed up is a big deal. Like, you can get a completely different voice by doing the same voice. Uh, Giddy Lee. Oh, yeah, Giddy Lee's a similar kind of thing where he just talks really slow. And he's like, well, I guess I can uh, help y'all out. See? Let's uh, get off this boat and get to work. Uh, that's Giddy Lee, my tortle, uh, who is one of the crew of my Friday game slash Monday game. So um, my turtle moral sounds a little bit like your turtle. Yeah, because I, I feel like turtles kind of have that sort of slow yeah, vibe, right? Slow. Yeah. And I might have even picked up my turtle from your turtle, you know? I think you did the voice once, right? Yeah. So it might have subconsciously Whoa. inflicted my toy, my toy things. Could be, could be. Um, but yeah, I go real slow and just kind of chill. And then like whenever I'm trying to make someone sound kind of handsome or cool, I'll try and go as deep as possible with my squeaky voice. So it'll be like, well then, we'll go down to the market soon. Let's uh, see what we can do. Uh, all right, heroes, assemble around me. We must go forth and sally to adventure. Uh, such and such and so forth. Uh, I just try to go as, as deep as I can go with my crappy, squeaky voice. <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, you know, you can always go gravelly. Uh, gravelly's an easy one. Just, well, I don't know much about this situation, but, uh, we need to get out of here. Uh, that's always, like, an easy to go to. You the don't want to do that too much, snake though. snake voice. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. snake race in class would solid snake be? Uh, Yonti, obviously. Yonti, yeah. oh my yeah. god. <laughs> Yeah, fight uh, fighter rogue, or barbarian. Assassin rogue. Uh, my drows, my drows are ripped 100% from Adventure Times. Uh, drow antagonist from the first adventure. Oh, darling, yeah. we must be simply getting through this as quickly as possible. Is it uh, Adventure any- Zone or Adventure Time? Adventure Zone, Zone. sorry, yeah. not Adventure yeah. Time. That's a shout uh, out to Matt Will Jackson for that <laughs> for fixing it. Boo-boo. We've been All drinking right, that damn Matt. Matt. If you I could uh, do an example there, Jay, one of the things I've been playing around recently with is if you are doing voices, and by you certainly don't need to, you can definitely vary your PCs by the descriptions that you give for them. Uh, if you are playing face-to-face in the body language you use but even the same kind of accent reads differently depending on a lot of different factors so if i go low and i talk like this and i keep saying fucking chart and arse and uh you know fuck you uh it, it reads very dwarf you know it reads yeah, low yeah, it's yeah. got a scottish brogue to it but if i go up here and i'm talking the same way and i'm using the same accent but it's a little bit lighter there's a bit more of a lie to it it reads a little bit more 
Irish, perhaps, and yeah. um, it, it it's better for you know your gnomes and your perhaps your halflings, something oh, like that. Yeah. I like to go up there for my. Uh, I like to really Fade. roll my R's for my yes, face. Yes, I can't roll. I like R's, to really roll my R's for my face. So good. I love it. Uh, when I go into the Feywild, I always do a voice like this. So, uh, something maybe getting away from uh, building NPCs, but working with NPCs in your world. And I think this one is uh, a great question because I know in our game it happens all the time. How do I get my players to stop talking my NPCs' ears off? Don't! Don't! <laughs> Let them roll. <laughs> yeah, if they're enjoying a conversation with an NPC, you know what that means? That means you did a good job making that NPC. It means you made someone interesting and funny and engaging. And, like, the point of the game is not to win. The point of the game is to have fun for two hours with people you love. Well, let's back this up. Let's get the whole set of details here. This is coming from Doom Cross, again, no. on the RPG section of Stack Exchange. And Doom Cross says, I'm a rather new DM, still learning stuff. So I've noticed that my characters tend to talk too much with NPCs, trying to get a lot of information and probably even trying to cheat thinking that the NPC should have info about everything. And then the players are sad and think that the NPC is dumb because he does not know the answers to all of their questions. This usually takes a long time and is enjoyed only by about half of my players, so the others tend to get pretty bored during this dialogue. How do I indicate to my players that an NPC is no longer useful and that they should move on after exhausting the dialogue? At the same time, I still want to be polite with the players and if the NPC is good aligned especially. Just saying, I need to go is probably okay sometimes, but what are some other options here? There should always be a sense of urgency in your D&D games. So it might be that you're allowing a more relaxed kind of... Maybe you need to give them a ticking clock, right? Like some sort of danger. And they can't spend all day... And as they're talking to this person, you can be, as the DM, inserting consequences for their lengthy conversation. So... Like, hey, I'm, uh, okay, I need to ask this person one more question. All right, as you begin to ask them that question, you can feel the ground rumble under your feet as the enemy approaches ever nearer. And then that'll give them a sense of urgency, like, oh, I'm asking this question, I could be doing something else, is this the right use of my in-game time? And then if they keep <laughs> pushing it too much, you just bust something through the wall, Kool-Aid man style, and start initiative, you know? Yeah, and impatience is a thing that you can, um, uh, communicate words are hard now that i've been drinking all day but um <laughs> you know get across with your other you know npcs what I hear helps sober you up what what's this bananas no jerica <laughs> i've been drinking all day you know what i came here to support you guys and now i'm drunk <laughs> but, but your drunkenness supports us. it supports it's supportive something i was talking about a second ago impatience impatience is a general rule if i were an npc in a game and some asshole walked up to me and was like hey what do you know about this did you ever meet this guy do you know this and asked me 50 freaking questions i would punch them like as an npc <laughs> you don't have to be like as the dm you don't have to be a patient npc if someone has asked you too many questions and you're done walk away <laughs> you can give your players hints that this npc is is out of information by just their sheer human uh, impatience. You know, not a lot of people are going to be willing to just stand around while some random stranger asks them 50 questions about their hometown. This is absolutely true. That's what I was going to say, too, is that they're not... They Like, there's this kind of video game system where, like, as gamers who have grown up within uh, playing, you know, ye old RPG, you know that it's a, a pre-programmed conversation tree and you want to eke out every last you know option and every last bit of discussion for chivos or or X xp or whatnot and that is not how real people work and that is the magic of DD is they can there's far more verisimilitude in the people that you are going to interact with because they'll just be like i'm not interested in this conversation anymore and yeah. you're a little pushy for someone i just met exactly i'm going to leave or and shank the, you the real world for those of us who played a lot of world of warcraft or other video games or anything where the quest line is pre-established for you. You usually meet NPCs who are just there to give you the information you need to know. In my world, as a DM, that is definitely not the case. You know, if you're, you're going to run into NPCs who have no idea who you are and don't care, 
And sometimes you have to do a little bit more digging than you would with a normal, you know, um, breadcrumbs type video game because it's a storytelling game. I'm not just going to give you the answers. You Sometimes you're going to have to get dig. But I think that's sometimes what makes NPCs a bit more compelling is, you know, that they're not pre-programmed uh, characters in a video game. Yep. And you can have NPCs who are aggressive, who are, you know, rude, who are just confrontational. People, uh, flawed individuals can exist in your world and they all enrich that world, make it better than it was. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 realistic to real life that you would have NPCs who are, you know, a little uh, a little feisty. So yeah, it's okay if that's what it takes to get your players to to be a little more. But like, you shouldn't be afraid of players liking your NPCs because that's like the objective. You know, like you want them to like your NPCs, but if they're really just milking them for information, then yeah. Install a time crunch, you know, give them, give the NPCs negative qualities or have the NPCs react adversely to being pumped for information. That's all great advice. Um, so if we have plumbed the depths of uh, how much bullshit NPCs will tolerate from the party, our next question uh, has to do with a little bit more of what we've been talking about, about creating NPCs on the fly, which is getting into the math of it. How do you generate uh, ability scores, skills, and whatnot on the fly. So this is a question coming from, I hope I'm getting this right, Avios, Av Avios, Av Avois, possibly, A-V-I-O-S-E. <laughs> does that, um, does that uh, wine have a good bouquet, a, bu a good Avois? Avois? <laughs> <laughs> I Avois? <laughs> that Tev bouquet. Yeah, we got oh, there. I thought, we I got there, team. I thought you were playing on terroir. I mean, yeah, a little bit. A little <laughs> bit. <laughs> French words are fun. Um, so this question again on Stack Exchange, the RPG subdoming thereof. When developing a new NPC, how do I ensure that they have close to the skill rankings that I would expect them to have, yet not make them more powerful than, say, the PCs? As an example, I want a noble that is decent in politics. He needs to be skilled enough that negotiating with him is relatively tough, even on a skill-by-skill -skill basis, yet he shouldn't be of such a high level that uh, the adventurers can't convince him of anything or get any information out of him at all. Or I have a blacksmith that is world-renowned for being one of the best there is. People People come from miles around just to look at his wares. How do I ensure he lives up to his reputation without simply fudging numbers and making and without making him as good as the player characters are better at fighting? Say, I, I fudge numbers. I'm fudge gonna be, it. I, I'm gonna be real honest with my players watching. I, I fudge. All DMs do. But the do. thing is, yes, and you here's haven't the thing: DM'd if you, you don't fudged. always fudge. So you, so like, if you're gonna call your DM on a fudge, you better be. Damn sure. Because if it's one of those times they didn't fudge, now you're the best. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. They're your DM. They're here to create a story for you. So if you have to fudge the numbers to make the story flow in the way that you wanted it to, or the way, not necessarily the way you wanted it to, but in a way that's productive for the team, then that's your job as the dungeon master or dungeon mistress to make sure things flow in a way that makes sense. Uh, Supernaut has uh, offered this great piece of wisdom. Numbers are not even real. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you don't know what I real rolled. Ones. <laughs> can, can I um, take a complete aside okay. to tell an anecdote that has nothing to do with D&D? Yes, please. Those are my please. favorite parts of this podcast. So I remember being in, I believe it's grade 10 or 11 mathematics, and our teacher saying, okay, now what do you think happens if we try to get the square root of a negative number? Say, negative nine. And we're like, well, that's not possible. There's no number you can multiply by itself to get a negative. A negative and a negative is a positive and a positive and a positive is a positive. She's like, no, you're wrong. It's three I. What does the I stand for? It's an imaginary number. And I literally remember my, yeah, my myself story. mouthing, Ooh, oh, fuck dolphin. off. And I raised my hand. I'm like, they're all imaginary numbers. You can't make any of them more imaginary than the others. <laughs> and that's how I got kicked out of grade 10 math class. Uh, let's see. What is a fun question that I can hit you with? The next one I had. Okay, well, I think uh, this one is probably both amusing and a classic conundrum in the D&D &D world which is 
How to make deception by NPCs work in an engaging manner. We are playing in a world with a certain degree of realism. For me, this includes deception. Deception can be found anywhere. Uh, it's a somewhat a longer question, so I'm just going to read their TLDR, which is, how can I make NPCs use deception without the players starting to question every single thing they hear from anyone around the world, leading to a slow and eventual ruined roleplay as they become completely paranoid that they are surrounded by liars? I mean, I think a lot of this comes down to the, to the disposition of the players, but there are hints you can give. So um, I've actually had real trouble with this. I can relate to this problem because my players 100% stop trusting my NPCs in the game before you all. Maybe <laughs> if they stop screwing us over. All you, the don't time. <laughs> you don't know me. You don't know me. Some people are bad. <laughs> uh, I think the important thing is to give them a good balance. Like if every NPC you introduce does screw over your players, then yeah, they are right to be paranoid. <laughs> they are right to be afraid. Like, if everyone you meet ends up stabbing you in the back, then yeah, yeah. you're gonna start being... You're not gonna want to meet people That's anymore. just not fair. I know, I keep reminding my players the importance of insight checks, which is adorable because that's the name of this podcast. Hey! Ooh, insight check hey is yo. important, and it's also available every Wednesday in Podbean, Podcatcher, <laughs> exactly. Stitcher. But it's goddamn important because, I mean, I know I... I was recently a guest on the F team as Celeste and caused some drama in that my character, she didn't necessarily lie, but she told her version of the truth to a group of people and caused some problems. And an insight check very easily could have c corrected some of those problems. But if you're... And not only that, sometimes NPCs give bad information just because they don't know. Because they, like, yeah. they may not know that what they're... Yeah. Exactly. They are not necessarily lying to you on purpose. They're telling you their version of the truth. So, yeah, it's... I did, I did this recently with the Team F. Uh, they uh, were told that it was a Yanti they were after and it was a Dragonborn. Uh, but the person I just didn't know the difference. I knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I had the same thing uh -huh. happen, you know. Except for the damn metagaming that was happening. They did metagame. I Look out for the drow. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's it's perfect. That's exactly the, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, sometimes NPCs are going to give you wrong information on accident, on purpose, but it's D&D. &D. So as Jerry says, play some fucking D&D. &D. Roll a goddamn <laughs> dice. If you want to know what's actually going on, do an insight check. Yeah, that's so true. Also, ooze the muse. Welcome to the chat. Wow! Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I've been drinking Hennessy. I've been drinking whiskey. My insides are on fire. This is starting to become a country song very quickly. That's what oh, we do. My insides are on fire. I've been drinking Hennessy. My wife is a liar. Air. I live in Tennessee. Air, save us. How would you make them less deceptive seeming? I think my number one tr tip is to use this as a teachable moment to improve role play uh, in that if you always are like, I do an inside check, I do an inside check, I do an inside check. That's not really paranoia on behalf of your character. It's more maybe power gaming or trying to squeak out or eke out a little bit more information. I always say that like a player should not be the one asking for an insight check necessarily they can That's certainly fair. say they want to they want to uh, i'm aiming for an insight check but the question i would put back is like how are you doing it because yeah. if you have an npc who's really cagey and you know they're really hard to read that player needs to earn that inside check through role play what are you doing what leverage do you have on this person i'm going to go right back to dungeon roll again because dungeon world again but um they're kind of charisma based interacting with a pc one of the requirements of it of it is you have leverage on that npc now it can be anything as simple as tell me you're all good you um, <laughs> but um it, it it the whole crux of it is why how are you getting this extra information what are you saying do you have some sort of secret intel on this person that you can drop and gauge their reaction or do you is this person start part of an organization that you know the secret handshake for and you can build some rapport and trust with them Did so i like dungeon to roll air pretend i don't know what that is Dungeon World is a hack of Apocalypse World, which was created by uh, Sage Latora and Adam Coble, who's uh, someone we've talked to a lot. 
uh, talked about He's a so lot, great, rather. Yeah. Now I'm just projecting. But uh, it's a it's almost it's a very stripped down and streamlined, more narrative uh, driven system. Uh, but it's still very D and D. It's got a lot of classic fantasy tropes. The classes are very familiar. Their abilities are very familiar. Uh, but we we ran a session of it. And we did an episode on it a little while back, and uh, it's got a it's got a lot of great kind of like anything that's wisdom based it's always about asking the dm questions or something like you get to choose from this list of questions and so you're trying to use those in such a way as to like get the most information because they're very open-ended uh and it all depends on your roles but yeah why is this npc giving any sort of tells to you at all tell me what you're saying to them and we'll see if you can kind of get eke an insight check out of the quality of the role play you're delivering well yeah and that makes sense because dungeons and dragons is a collaborative storytelling game so it's not just a click that npc and see what they know it's a yeah how did you do that what did you say to them that convinced them to give you that information and i think as a dm that's really important and i i find that especially because i have several new players um, especially people who are new to role playing, that they find that those types of situations really cause them or force them to find out more about how their character thinks. And that can be super helpful for a role playing game. Absolutely. Absolutely. As always, thank you for joining us on another episode of Insight Chat. If you have any questions for us or you'd like us to talk about a certain topic or you just want to say hi, add us on at Insight Check Pod. It is a great way to get in touch. Also, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a like and a review, uh, preferably five stars. If you can find five stars laying around, give them to us. So many stars. Uh, (laughs) That is on iTunes. We are available there. Uh, Of course, we're on Stitcher and all your other favorite apps as well. And we want to thank Amy T. Falcone for our faces. Without you, we would not have faces. It's so beautiful. Uh, We'd also like to thank Vin Swept for their beautiful song, which we use as our intro and outro. Never stand alone instrumental version. There is a lyric version with lyrics. It has lyrics. (laughs) Answering your cues from our collective A's. This was Insight, Insight Check. <laughs> got get it on the first She's first take. Get it. First I don't take. know what to do. Woo-hoo. Donated a hundred dollars and it says Team Alpha for the win. Just blasphemy. Well played. Well played. So I guess that total goes to Team Alpha's total. <laughs> no, no, we get to keep that money. We just have to read the message. Exactly. We did our part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did what we had to do. All right, Team Alpha for the win. You got it, Cupcake. But Team Omega gets your money. <laughs>